الفاتحة حضر الله نعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللئيم الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا عبد القاسم محمد وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين اما بعد اللہ میں صلاح واجب on us in order that we maintain an obligation that is tedious and monotonous prayer is something that we are doing every day and we are doing it every day five times a day and hence it's not something that Allah made exciting. It's not something that Allah made enjoyable. It's not something that Allah made attractive and appealing. In fact, when you look at it, you see that you're doing the same thing over and over again. The same prayer you're making over and over again. The same dhikr you're reading over and over again. And the reason that he made it such, that if Allah had wanted, the many other things that he had made very attractive. If you see that a lot of things in Islam that Allah has given are attractive, he put a lot of reward behind it, he put so many things behind it. But when it comes to prayer, he made it monotonous. He made it something that you do every day. The reason is that he wants to discipline us. He wants us to be disciplined in just listening to him, in obeying his commands, in doing what he has asked us to do. And in doing that, in doing something that we do every day monotonously, he is building us up to see how do we treat something that you do every day. See, when it comes to Laylatul Qadr, inshallah we will speak about that in the next few days. When it comes to that, you see that Allah has, because it's once a year, it comes around once a year, so it's attractive for the people. They don't have to do it every day. They don't have to do it every night. Because it's once a year, you see that attraction is there. And so many rewards are in there. And so many things that Allah attached to it as incentives. So it becomes attractive for us. Ziyarat, when we go for that, it's attractive for us. Because it doesn't happen every day. We go there once in a while. And when we do go for Ziyarat, there's excitement. There's that enjoyment. There's that attraction that Allah has put in there. But prayers, Allah has kept every day. Just keep that in mind. The prayer is every day and five times a day and it's just tedious and monotonous and Allah now wants to see how do you deal with something that you do every day. That you do every day. How are you maintain, How are you able to maintain yourself when you do things every day? You see, things that are commonplace, things that are every day, how a person treats those things shows what type of character does he have. What kind of a person are you? What kind of a character do you have is decided when you see how you treat things that you see every day, that you experience every day. I'll give an example so that you understand this very well. What it means by this. You see, if you meet someone new 
in the masjid, right? You meet someone in the masjid. Now you meet them, for example, once a week. Well, now once a week when you meet them, you know, you smile. How are you doing? How's everything? How are things going? And you're like excited to meet them. You know, there's talk, there's conversation. You're asking about different things. And you see that behavior of yours is that of a person who is smiling, an individual who is happy to meet them, and it shows your good akhlaq. It shows your good akhlaq. And of course, this is a good thing. Right? It's a good thing that when you meet someone, and you'll see, you'll never do this. Yeah? Unless you're completely you know, depressed, and you have issues in your mind that are you know, eating you up. But on the normal, when you meet people, you meet them with good akhlaq, you meet them smiling, you meet them nicely. Those who you meet once a week or once in a while. But your character is not known by that. Your character is not judged by that. It's a good thing, it's a good habit that when you meet people who you meet once a week, once in a while, that you meet them nicely with good behavior, with good akhlaq, with, you know, with good etiquette and manners. But your character is not known by that. Your character is known by how you treat the people you meet every day. Your parents, your wife, and your children, do you behave the same way as if you behave with an individual you meet once in a while? Or when you come home, you're like, oh, okay, I'm back. And everyone, you know, they are excited to see you, but you yourself are like, Listen, I'm a headache, you know, so just keep away. Understand this. Here, you're meeting your children every day. You see them every day. You see your wife every day. You see your spouse every day. You see your parents every day. So now, how do you treat them? Is your treatment of them the same way that you treat other people? Are you smiling when you see them? Are you happy when you see them? Are you attracted when you see them? Is there an appeal? Is your behavior different? Is your behavior in a way that they will feel happy to see you? You see, how you treat your family that you meet every day is what shows what kind of a character you have. Otherwise, meeting people once in a while, that shows a good habit, but it doesn't show character. Character is known by how you meet and treat people that you see every day. This is why Allah, when He made namaz and salat wajib every day, He wants to see, do you see, treat it the same way as if you would treat Laylatul Qadr? Or are you just like saying, oh, I'm doing this again and again and again, and this is monotonous, and I'm doing this every day, and I'm bored of it. Character is known by how you treat prayers. Your character is known by that. Are you bored because you're doing it every day? If that's the case with your family also, you will be the same way. You see, when a person has character, moral fiber, that's when you will see he will start to treat those people who he meets every day, smiling and happy. Prayers discipline us for that. When you pray, that's what prayers discipline you for. This is what it's meant for, the, one of the reasons, and I'm giving that, so that we understand how to improve our prayers and make them acceptable in the eyes of Allah. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The fact is, at the time we go for ziyarat, it is said to us, and those who have been to ziyarat know this because they heard it all the time, we go there. But those who haven't been there, I'm telling you now. When you go to ziyarat, when you go to Karbala, of course the enjoyment is there, the attraction is there. But we are told, don't stay there more than three days. You should come for ziyarat for three days and after that go away. Why? Because obviously, because of the fact that in Ziyarat, the issue that happens that when you reach there, obviously your heart and mind and your soul is in the Ziyarat, just to visit Imam Hussain, just to visit the Shohata, the martyrs. You want to visit them and your heart is there and you're crying and everything is there. 
I said, second day when you come around, you know you still have that you eat the ziyarat and do things. Third day when it comes around, you know, you'll still have something left over in your gas tank of spirituality. And you go there, and you visit them, just eat the ziyarat and go away. And usually we see from the fourth day onwards, right, everyone who goes for a ziyarat, they're in the bazaar shopping. Right, they see the haram, yeah. Alaikum alaykum ya Abdullah and walk away. That's it. Just the fact that Allah does not want that ihtiram, that honor and that respect for the mazar and for the haram of the imams to go down in your heart. He said just do it three days and that's it. After that go away from there. He doesn't want that ihtiram and that attraction to go away. But prayers is different. Allah did not make prayer once in a while. He made prayers every day. And the reason for prayer is different than the reason for ziyarat. Ziyarat is to go there because that attraction is there and that love is there and to fulfill your love and to enjoy the trip that you want to visit the Imam. But prayer is when you make every day of your life and you're making five times a day. Now Allah, where is the attraction in this? There's no appeal in this. Allah is saying, this is not for attraction. This is not for appeal. You are praying every day not to enjoy it, but so that I may discipline you and that you make yourself like that which you do every day. Really? Raise his marifat, raise himself, that we pray every day, we get used to it, and then we get used to it, we say that, listen, this is, I will make this, I will get to be like this, I will make myself used to life and prayers. This is what it's meant for. This is what it's meant for, my friends. One of the things I understand about prayers, you know, uh, in prayer, you are fighting yourself and your nafs. There's a war that's going on. We all want to improve ourselves. You hear it when you think about Akhlaq and Irfan. How you want to go close to Allah. And people who don't understand what Irfan is, they will point you towards other things. They say, if you want to learn Irfan, you have to learn philosophy. And you have to learn these complicated matters. And if you don't learn that, then you cannot be an RF. You cannot be close to Allah. If you don't learn those things that are complicated and hard. And they make it into such a big obstacle that anyone who even wants to walk that path will never go there. Because it's too just, just plain too hard for him. It's too hard for him. So what do you do then? These people get frustrated. And the fact is that Irfan and Ma'rifa and going closer to Allah, Qurba towards Allah, getting near Allah has nothing to do with these things, my friend. They will help you. But the real place where you do jihad, the only place, not the real place, the only place to go close to Allah is in prayers. That's it. It's in prayers, my friends. That's it. That's the only place where you can go to Allah. Your nearness to Allah depends on how much you improve your prayer. Your whole and soul battle is in prayer. Nowhere else. Everywhere else, there's some self-interest involved. In every other thing that you do for Allah, there's some self-interest involved. But in prayer is the only place where a person can sincerely fight against his nafs and against shaitan. My friend, when you look at this, you'll see. Prayer. You know, the best prayer is in Jamaat. Jamaat is in the masjid. And in the masjid, 
The most sacred place in the masjid is where? Mehram. Mehram. Right, we have the Mehram here, right? Mehram. The most sacred place in the masjid is where? Mehram. Now when you're in Mehram, of all the places, this is the most important place in the masjid. Meaning, prayers are the best when they're in the masjid. And in the masjid, the most important place is Mehram. Now Allah, why did you call it Mehram? Why do you call it Mehram for? You know what Mehram means? Mehram is from the word Harb. Harb means war. Mehram means battlefield. In other words, Allah is calling the most holiest place for prayer, which is in the masjid, and the holiest place in the masjid, He's calling that a battlefield. Allah, you should have called it something else, like Masjid, the place of Sajda, or Marhamat, you know, the place of Rahmah, or any of these other nice, soft names. Why are you calling it Battlefield for? Why are you calling this place a battlefield? Allah is warning us to know that in the only place where you do battle with shaitan, where you sincerely battle with shaitan, where you sincerely battle with your nafs is in your prayer. There's nowhere else you can battle shaitan. There's nowhere else you can battle shaitan. This is where you battle shaitan, my friend. Understand what I'm saying? Why prayer is so important? Why did he make it watch it every day? Because it's in prayers where you're doing jihad with your nafs. Nowhere else can you do jihad with your nafs. You want to give money to the masjid, to Allah's cause? You want to give money for that? There's something involved in it. There's a self-interest in it. Why? Because when you give money, it's not blind that you're giving money. You're giving money to someone. When you're giving money to someone, he is seeing that you're giving money. And hence that feeling that hey, he knows I'm good is in between. He knows that I'm good, I gave money. I have a witness. You see? There's some self-interest in war. You want to be good to others and help others? It's a very good thing. Go and help others. Alhamdulillah, Allah will reward you for it. But there's self-interest involved there. Because when you're helping others, now that person who you're helping, you know that he owes you. Even if you don't want it, he will understand you have done ihsan on him. There's self-interest there. There's self-interest there. You want to teach someone? When you teach someone, you're teaching someone your student. At least that student knows that he has been taught by you and he owes you for that. Everything in Islam, there is self-interest involved, my friends. The only place self-interest is not involved is in prayer. When you stand up in prayer alone, no one is there. It's just you and Allah. Only Allah is watching. That's why the only place where you can do jihad with your nafs is in prayers. Really, this is the only place where you can do jihad. There's no other place you can do jihad with nafs. That's why Allah make prayer wajib five times a day, every day. Why? Because this is where jihad is going on. When you improve your prayer, then you know you're improving in your faith and everything else. You're winning against this jihad. Right? You're winning against this jihad that is there. If you are improving prayer, you know, our teachers in the house are at home, right? They used to tell us all the time. They said that when you go out, obviously when you go out amongst the people, you know, I mean, there will be many people who will listen to you. You know, obviously when we were in the house, and I was in the house, you know, I'm just a student, nothing. I'm just a student, I'm nothing over there. You know, I'm learning with an ustad, he's teaching me, and I remember in the class, my teacher gave an example of me. He says this, am I big here? Here he's a student, sitting here, this and that, learning. But when he goes back to America, there he will be a big alim. And people will regard him as a big alim there. And this and that, he was telling them. He said, listen, there when you go there, 
When you go out to preach, you'll see many people will listen to you. You will have crowds of hundreds of people, sometimes thousands of people listening to you. How do you know that you're growing? How do you know that you're improving? How do you know that you are becoming good? If your audience increases from 100 to 1000, does it mean that you have gone close to Allah? If more people are saying, Baba Asantum Subhanallah Narehati, does that make you closer to Allah? How do you know that you are becoming closer to Allah? He says, the only way, the only litmus test that's there is to see yourself in prayer. Are you more in love with prayer? Are you more careful of prayer than before? If you are more careful, then it means you're growing closer to Allah. Friend, it's prayer that's it. That's our test. You want to test yourself? Test yourself in prayer. Wow, do I pray? How do I pray? Am I improving in prayers? Am I observing the rules? Or am I taking it light? I'm taking it easy. Sometimes I'm not even praying at all. Look at yourself. That is how faith is tested. There's no other way to test faith. If anyone says, and this is a blasphemy when they say this, Ah, uh -huh, I don't pray, but Alhamdulillah, I have a lot of Iman in Allah. Oh, stop fooling yourself. Stop fooling Allah. You can't fool Allah anyway. Stop fooling yourself by saying these stupidity, these idiotic statements. You're saying, I have a lot of faith in myself. I believe in Allah. Ah, your faith is known by how careful you are in prayers. How much you observe prayers. How much importance you give to prayer. That's how your faith is judged. Allah gave prayers in order to judge your faith. In order to judge your faith, how faithful you are. Right? It's high time that people stop fooling themselves and say that, you know what, Alhamdulillah, I have this faith and I have this Iman. And you know what, whenever I hear the name of Imam Hussain, I cry this and that. You know, it's all well and good, my friends. But it doesn't show that you have character nor faith. But sure you have character when you start doing the obligations Allah has given you every day. How much care for you in prayers? How much do you recognize prayers? How much do you stand at the first time of prayers? This is how your faith is judged. So.
And an example that you can relate to, I'll just tell. You see, you heard this many times in speeches, many ulama they make a mistake. For example, you see, you have Ahlul Bayt, and you have those companions that oppose Ahlul Bayt. There are those companions who took the right of Ahlul Bayt and sat on the seat of Khilafat and this and that. You have those companions. And on one hand, you have Ahlul Bayt. So on one hand, you have Ali. On the other hand, you have the three kings. Now, when you look at Ali as opposed to the three kings, what is more important? Is it more important to put the three kings down or is it more important to raise Ali? You that understand that what I'm saying, my friends? This is the ideology that Imam Ali salam gave us. This is the ideology that he gave us. Let me read a hadith for you from Imam Ali so you understand this. It is said that in this he said, "Adum al Khalik fi anfusihim." The Aluma Khalik fi Anfusihim raise the significance of your Khalik and Creator in yourself. Then he uses the word Fa, meaning then. Right after that, if you do that, then everything else other than that will become lower in your eyes and will lose its significance. If you raise And hence to us, the job is not to see Batil and put it down. Batil will go away automatically. You don't have to fight Batil. You just have to raise Hak in your heart. That's why he said, Ida ja'al Hak, wa al Batil. When Hak comes, Batil will disappear automatically. Batil will go away. Don't worry, it's gone. It's finished. Batil will go away. Raising Allah in your heart is more important. If you understood that, send me a salawat. No, there are a lot of things to say, but because we have a long program tonight, I will just restrict myself in saying only a few things so that you know we can go on with the rest of the program that we have. Just understand this, prayer my friend. When you come for prayers, when a person prays every day on time, this is what builds your character, this is what builds your moral fiber. This is the story of today. Your character is built when you pray every day on time and observe the rules of prayers. That's what builds the character. A person, a man, you know, who was not religious, he was not religious. He went to uh, see the girl. Now, uh, he was a religious, but he came from a religious family. And he said that, listen, I want a girl who's not religious. And he asked his mother to look for a girl who's normal. She doesn't wear hijab, she doesn't do these things, she's a modern girl. I want to look, I want you to look for a girl like that. So they found a family that's more doesn't care about religion. So he said, Alhamdulillah, you know I mean? All my life I grew up in this house, having to worry about wajibat and haram. I want to live a life now. I don't have to worry about it, so I don't need a wife who's going to nag me. I am going to get a wife that's going to be non-religious. She has nothing to do with Islam, and hence we can live a carefree life and enjoy our life. So he went to seek her hand. Went to seek her hand. And said that, you know, obviously, you know, they went to the house to seek the hand, you know, how they come, you know, khasdari and proposal and all that. They went there. So, when they went for that, so, he's expecting them to, you know, ask about mahar and, you know, these type of things, you know, wheeling and dealing type things, you know. And the girl also is not wearing hijab, she comes out without any hijab and this and that. And, uh, she, you know, so he said, well, okay, you know, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask yourself questions, you're going to get married and get to know one another. The first question the girl asked, the first question the girl asked is that, do you pray? Do you pray on time? 
The man, obviously, thinking this is a non-religious family who have, who have nothing to do with Islam, what do they care? So he said, what do you care about if I pray or not? <laughs> you don't pray in you don't do any of these things. Why are you asking me for these things? Why are you asking me these things? You know? She said, no, I want to know if you pray or not. He said, but why do you want to know if I pray or not? Is prayer important to you? He asked the girl. She said, no, it's not important for me. Then why do you want to know if I pray or not? He said, because you're going to get married to me. He said, what does that mean? Understand the thinking of that girl. Understand the thinking of the girl. Listen, she said, listen. You want me as your wife. And you want me to trust you. You want me to have faith in you. You want me to be close to you. If you are not able to be faithful and trustworthy to your master, how can you be trustworthy to me? If you can be faithful to Allah who made you and has done so much for you, how will you be faithful to me? Even though I don't give importance to prayer, but I want someone who will give importance because he will make a good husband from me. My friends, Imam Hassan alayhi salatu wa salam has said, A person came to him and said, you know, my girl is the age of marriage, I'm looking for a husband for her, what should I look for in a husband? He says, look for a woman husband, a believing husband. Look for a husband who's believing and prays. And he said, why? I mean, what's the reason behind that? Imam Hassan explained that to him. Listen to how Imam Hassan explained it. He explained that and he said, listen, look for a woman husband because there are only two options that you have. Either your girl is good or your girl is bad. Either she's bad or either she's good. There's only two options. If your, if your daughter is bad, if your daughter is bad, then, you, then if, a, if he, she has a mu'min husband, then that mu'min husband will tolerate her. Whatever bad quality she has, he will tolerate her. And non-mu'min husband will say, the hell with this, let me get another one. If that's a mu'min husband, he will tolerate, he will be sabir with her. And if she's a good girl, then he will appreciate her goodness. A non-woman will never appreciate how good she is. This, my friends, understand? Why prayers are so When you look for someone in marriage, look for prayer. Does he pray on how much important he gives for prayer? Look for that. And when you see that, then you know you found a husband who is going to be good to you. That's what you look for in a husband. You see, Imam Hassan is advising us that. Just one more thing I'll say, my friends. Really, if we raise Allah in our eyes, then dunya is going to become low. That's why Allah says that when you come for prayer, don't think about dunya. Let me just explain to you about shoekeepers. Yeah, have you ever been to, you know, uh, haram? Haram, any haram, you know, you go to any haram, you know, this and that. Right? If you've been there, there are shoekeepers outside, you know, they take your shoes, you know, and they hold on to your shoes and they go back inside. You know, you, you can go inside and you come outside and get the shoes and go. Shoekeepers. I'll just explain to you the philosophy of shoekeepers. Just now. What is the role of these shoekeepers? What do they do? They, when you go in to make the other, when you go in to pray, they make sure that your shoes are taken care of while you're inside praying so that when you come out, you can take your shoes and go. In the old days when we don't have shoekeepers, right, what used to happen was that every time we go there, we have to walk out or walk back barefoot. You never find our slippers. Right? But the shoekeepers help us, right? The shoekeepers make sure that our shoes are maintained. They take our shoes as an amanat. And they keep the shoes there. Subhanallah. If we can thank them for that, wouldn't it be really nice if we can thank them? Thank you for making sure my shoes have been kept right. And they're not lost. They're not harmed. You kept my shoes 
as an amanat and thank you for giving it back when I come out. You see, this is not a new thing. It goes back all the way. All the way when Musa, Prophet Musa went to see Allah the first time. When he came to Wadi al When he came to Wadi al As he was entering, Allah says, Fakhlan alayk. In the, in the kafi, Wadi al He says, take off your shoes. Put them outside. You are in Wadi al here. Don't bring your shoes in here. Put them outside. You see, those shoes were kept outside. Musa kept the shoes outside so he can come in. And when we went to the tafsir, why did Allah ask him to leave the shoes outside? Did you ever understood that? A lot of people think that, you know, well, you enter because there'll be dirt in the shoes. And this, no, that has nothing to do with the dirt in the shoes or any of these type of things. Why did Allah ask him to leave the shoes outside? Because the Imams have said, the shoes represent your dunya. Shoes represent your dunya. When you come to worship Allah and pray Allah, leave your dunya outside. And then come pray. It is like the shoekeepers in the haram. When you go there, you leave the shoes outside and you go inside. They hold your shoes as an amana that when you come outside, they give them back. Allah is saying, when you come for my ibadah, when you come to my worship, I will do the same for you. Leave your dunya outside. I will be your ameen and I will handle that dunya for you until you go back. I will make sure nothing happens to your dunya. They are not broken down or they are not ripped or these type of things. But if you give your broken shoes to Allah as an amana, then Allah will also repair those shoes for you. He will also repair those shoes for you. He will repair your dunya for you. When you leave the dunya outside and come here, Allah will repair it for you. Even if it's broken down. Even if your business is not working, but when you come for this ibadah, then Allah is saying, I am your Ameen, I will take care of your dunya outside. If Allah has given us that much guarantee, now why is it that we are fearful and worried of coming to the masjid? Why are we fearful of coming to the masjid? It takes my whole evening away, I have business to do. Allah is saying, I will be your Ameen. Don't you trust me? I will take care of your dunya outside. I will take care of that. Just like you give your shoes to the shoes, I will take those shoes of yours and I will make them for you, repair it for you, make them better. SubhanAllah. My friends, prayer, when you come for ibadah, when you come for prayer, read, Allah is offering so much to you. Don't be afraid of your dunya when it comes. Don't be afraid of your dunya when it comes. When you come over here, think of it that Allah is, He is the Ameen of your dunya. If anything happens, you say, Allah, what happened to my dunya? I left it in your hands. Nothing will happen to it. When Allah is the Ameen, you will never do Qiyamah. You will never be a Qayyam to your Amanat. In fact, He will make it better for you. He will improve it for you. This is the trust we need to have in Allah. My friends, prayers. Making it one, it's watching on us to discipline us and we do it so that we can build our character and our moral fiber. And then trust in Allah. Trust in Allah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq and the blessing to be on the right path and wisdom to understand his guidance. Haste to the great prayers of our Imam Amika says, Help him when he comes. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillah bin alami. Salam. Inshallah, we have uh, Dwight Iftitah right now. Right after Dwight Iftitah, we'll start the uh, children's program, the kids' program. It's an exciting uh, 
night of events that we have lined up. So inshallah all the kids that are here, inshallah they stay behind after Dua Iftita so that we can start the program right after.